Hi. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about extension outputs. And so if you recall from the, uh, the grad introduction to the, the school, um, our department has a requirement for our graduate students to, to take our course, to develop an extension plan, and then have an extension plan point to a certain output that you're going to do. And so when you leave this course, um, you'll have just about all that met except for actually doing the extension activity. And, uh, and if you look at the policy, it's, it's a little bit vague on what that is. And that's by design because we want to give you a lot of flexibility. So you do something that fits really with what your skill set and your interests are and something hopefully that'll fit well with, with what your research is, is doing. And so with that, let's uh, go ahead and get started. Sorry about it, I gotta navigate this, make sure I'm doing everything that I need to do. Okay. So, so again, uh, what I wanna do is, is talk a little bit about some different types of outputs that you wanna, may wanna consider. Uh, just talk a little bit about kind of uh, what the process is for these things. Uh, some of them are pretty straightforward or some, some have a little bit more um, uh, steps involved, that kind of a thing. Uh, and then also just kind of some general advantages and disadvantages of each type. Um, ultimately, what you select is gonna depend on a couple of things. Uh, the goal is, is you do something that dovetails very well with what your research is. And, and in that way, it's going to kind of be less of doing a separate project, more about your whole project here at your time at Purdue. Okay, and so that's important. Uh, the other thing is, is what your interests or skills are. So some of you may think like, look, um, I don't want to write something else, so I just want to give a program uh, somewhere else uh, to, to, to a certain audience. Um, some may look at it the opposite, say, well, you know what, um, I don't have a lot of experience doing videos. That's something I really want to get more involved in. And so you may select something that kind of helps build a skill that you want to build. And so it's, there's really no right or wrong answer. It really depends on you. Uh, later on in the course, when we get into the logic model and planning part, we'll start to kind of fit the pieces around what you want to do in terms of who your target audience is, what are your desired outcomes, those kinds of things. Uh, but for right now, you should really start to think about what you want to do and how that might fit with your research. Uh, in terms of looking at what graduate students have done in the past, and so uh, 2013 was the first cohort we had where we had graduate students go through and, and, and report what they've done. And so the minimum is one, that's all you're required to do. Uh, and again, that's a discussion that you're gonna have with your major professor and your committee. Uh, but we've had students do up to 17, believe it or not. And so the average is really uh, about three and a half. And so that might surprise you. But a lot of times when you get involved in some of these things, uh, they, they tend to build on each other. And so uh, you may develop some type of a program or, or a talk that you end up doing in several different places. Or maybe you combine them and you, you do a couple programs. Uh, but then you also have uh, an extension publication that, that fits with that as well. And so that would be another deliverable. So that would count as three. Um, so there's, there's a lot of different ways to, to go about it. Uh, but again, it really depends on what you want to do in coordination with your major professor. That's really important. In terms of the things I'm going to talk about, this is it. Uh, publications, websites, webinars, videos. Uh, in-person programs, like a, giving a, a presentation or developing the program itself, and then also podcasts. Um, now, part of the thing you might want to think about is who's your target audience? Who are you delivering this to? What types of things do they utilize? Those are all important kinds of things. But again, I think um, an important part of this that can't be understated is what interests you. So this should be something that you really want to get behind and be passionate about. And that really kind of helps uh, where it becomes more of just part of what you do, not necessarily an added thing from that standpoint. So the first thing is publications. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, we do sell some printed publications uh, through the education store, but most of what we do in our department are web only. Uh, so it's, it's pretty straightforward from that st standpoint. Uh, a publication is something that you're detailing information um, and a lot of information. So it could be quite technical. 
uh, from those kinds of things. Um, from an evaluation standpoint, they're difficult to evaluate. You track, and we'll talk about evaluation later in the course uh, from that standpoint. But you know, when they make sense is that they're answers to frequent questions. Uh, it's things that don't change. And so you don't want to have to update a publication every year, every other year, because there's a whole process to those kinds of things um, from that standpoint. And then um, a lot of times it's complementing a, a certain program. So for, from an extension specialist standpoint, uh, when we have certain programs that we do, uh, for example, I do a lot of nuisance wildlife program. That's part of my, my, my area. And so I'll have publications on how to set traps, uh, permitting questions, things like that. Uh, because those are things that are quite universal, regardless of what problem you're dealing with. And so uh, there's a process to it. Uh, it's a lot of information. So it's better to kind of, hey, I'm going to talk a little bit about setting this box trap, but everything I say is like in this publication. So kind of pay attention, but also you have this information to re uh, reference at a later date. So as an example, so we track publication downloads every year and also sales, but I'm not going to really, really get into that. So this is an idea of, of some of the recent ones. This is from 2017. Um, I don't have uh, more um, recent data. I just got the report for 2020 uh, 20, uh, recently, but I didn't, didn't update this. Uh, but, but you can see like, so the Christmas tree publication, that one has, and it's pretty, pretty readily has over 100,000 downloads every year. Uh, so it has all sorts of different uh, um, areas here in terms of uh, food plots, log tree scaling techniques, uh, those kinds of things. So part of this, obviously, if it's a new publication, it's not going to have a lot of downloads you know, in its first year. Sometimes it takes a while for things to kind of get out there and announced. I think our department does a really good job of that in terms of their social media, our blog, or those kinds of things. We get the word out uh, very nicely with, with a lot of our resources. So you can go to our publication site. And so um, let me see if I can figure this out here, laser pointer. So if you went to resources, clicked on that, and then uh, there's publications and things on there that you, then you can sort through those and just kind of browse and kind of, you can look around, see what, give you an idea of kind of what's been done. Uh, so it's always a good idea to look at what's been done, right? So if you have an idea on something on, you know, furniture or um, uh, invasive plant control or something like that, the first thing you want to do is, is see what's been done. So you're going to look through what our, not only our university has done, but maybe get some ideas from other programs and things like that as well. And so that's always a, a, a good thing to do. So all of our publications are on the education store. So if you're gonna do a peer reviewed publication, and so those are ones when you look at that, it's, it's got a number. Uh, so it'd be like, you know, FNR 514W, and that means it's a web only publication, that kind of a thing. And so you can expect the process to be about a three to six month timeline. So again, you're gonna look at what's current out there to see if there's actually a need here that this doesn't already exist, right? Just like a research project, you just don't go out and do a project, you do some lit review and figure out what, you know, what's been done, what are the questions, you know, that kind of a thing. Then you draft an article and then uh, for an FNR numbered publication, you have to get at least two peer reviews uh, and then you revise accordingly. And if they had some specific comments in there, um, there's a way to kind of document that. So it's very uh, analogous to a journal article where you submit a journal article, you get feedback from the reviewers. And then when you resubmit that article, uh, you have to document what you did and why, or if you didn't make a change, you have to justify it, that kind of a thing. Uh, but with most of these, there's really very few things that kind of come back. Uh, but, but that's it. So, so at Purdue, we have people that do the editing and uh, the layout. Um, a lot of the editing is done kind of in-house in by me as the department coordinator, uh, but they do all the layout. And so then they'll provide you the lead author with this is the proof, uh, make sure it's right. And then if you approve that, then it gets uh, numbered and put up on, on the website. And so it's pretty, pretty straightforward from, from that standpoint. <clears throat> Now, some publications are part of a series, and so um, we the, the Nature of Teaching is a program that uh, Rod Williams co-coordinates, uh, and it has certain guidelines and a way to go about it. And so if you're going to do something that is involved with a, a series, there may be certain things that you're required to do in terms of 
the, the uh, components to it in terms of what you require, in terms of teacher information, uh, student activities, uh, all this kind of stuff. Uh, but uh, Rod's got a person that kind of coordinates that program for him. And so if you would do something like this, uh, where it's a lesson plan uh, for, for youth, uh, they would work with you and, and that kind of a thing. So it's something that sometimes with some of these things, if it's involved with an existing series or program, you need to work with the people who run that program and make sure that everyone's on the same page and, and that they say, okay, this is, I like your idea. This would fit well with what we're doing. Let's work with you. Or it may be something like, look, this really isn't a good fit for what we're trying to do, but you may consider this or something. Okay, so it's kind of a back and forth kind of a thing. There are also publications um, that are part of an existing uh, outlet. And so one example of that is the Indiana Woodland Steward. Uh, I'm the editor of that, and it's a lot of uh, groups that are involved in putting this out. And so they, we produce three issues a year. It's directly mailed at no cost to, to uh, woodland owners. And so the topics uh, uh, mostly deal with forest management, wildlife management in, in woodlands, invasive species control, uh, economics, forest policy, all those kinds of things. And so this is available uh, on the uh, internet. And I think I'll provide a couple copies for you on Brightspace so you can kind of see, see how that looks. Um, but this is something that if you want to do that uh, you would contact me and say, you know, I've got an idea for an article. Uh, this is the focus of it. And, you know, this is something that would fit. And then I would take it back to the editorial board and we kind of, as a group, decide what we want to publish and what we don't. Uh, but usually we have a pretty good track record of publishing graduate student work because, quite frankly, a lot of times we're looking for content. And so that's a part of it. Uh, what might happen with these types of publications, not only Indiana Woodland Steward, but others, they may say like, well, right now we're booked for the next two issues, but we've, based on what you are proposing it would fit well in terms of the timing and the topic for the third issue you know next year or something like that and so you know you kind of have something like that um, situation so websites so so obviously we're all familiar with websites um, obviously uh, the content is really important so if you're producing a website and and things you know like for our extension website we've got new information up there all the time and so it's it's uh, it's um important from that standpoint in terms of users coming back and, and that kind of a thing uh most websites it's a year or less uh a lot of times anymore with some of the things on um, wordpress and some of those sites you can kind of get a, a the, the, the framework for a website and get it up there really really pretty quick um, from that standpoint when would you consider one uh, if you've got kind of a program and i'll give some examples to that or you've got kind of a suite of information so um, you know for as an example maybe your lab really focuses on in researching invasive species in a variety of different ways and so you might have like a bunch of invasive species content over the years and so maybe uh, the lab kind of put together a, a website that focuses on that. that that'd be kind of one example to do that uh, cost anymore, it's pretty minimal. If you do like a big one for, you know, and have a, a third party come in and put it together for you and do all that kind of stuff, you're talking tens of thousands of dollars. And in most cases anymore, you can do it yourself or hire a student or someone like that at, at a pretty reasonable cost. Um, the other thing is, is anytime you put content up online for public viewing, it has to be ADA compliant. And so there are some steps that you have to make sure that you're compliant from that. Uh, if you're posting PDFs, those, those have to be ADA compliant. If you've got web video on a website, it has to be closed captioned. So there are some things to kind of consider from that standpoint. Just real quick, some examples that students have done. So this was a student in Linda Prokofi's lab. Again, she, the, she, Linda had some money, I think, that kind of as part of the, the research grant to put this together. So this wasn't something that the student specifically designed totally on her own, but it was in coordination with her major professor in the lab. And so, but this was all based on uh, the typical new river and the issue of, of mussels in the river because there was an, um, um, an issue with water levels and about the, the lake and all this kind of stuff. I'm really not gonna, gonna get into it, but they created this, this website. So that's, that's an example. 
Um, we also had a student who was a, a student of Dr. DeWoody's, uh, did one on captive breeding. So they did a lot of genetic work uh, over the years. And so she put together this website on about captive breeding uh, from that standpoint. So this, this counted. You also might be a part in your research, part of a big project. And so there may be an opportunity not necessarily to put together the website because you know, a lot of you may not want to do that, but you may have an opportunity to, to um, develop content for a website. And so um, that might be something. Sometimes these websites you might put together um, uh, uh, some type of a instructional thing. Uh, maybe it's a talk, a webinar. Um, that would be kind of a part of that, or a lot of times it might be like a fact sheet or something like that, a series of fact sheets, or might be kind of just putting together the information on there. Maybe it's a, um, something that has research uh, data informed kind of decision making things on there. So it just kind of depends on what, what it is uh, from that standpoint. So depending on what you're doing, um, this kind of a model might be an opportunity to, to do something. So I just mentioned webinars, right? And so on our site, on the FNR Extension site, we do have a webinar uh, a page. We also have a Facebook uh, live page, Ask, Ask an Expert. And so um, with some of the challenges that we faced as a program this year in terms of not being able to do face-to-face -face programs and things, uh, we, we shifted focus in 2020 on doing a lot of online programs. And so we had a, an Ask an Expert uh, series where we're trying to do weekly series. Sometimes they were at lunch, sometimes they were in the, the evening. Uh, and we had graduate students uh, uh, also involved in some of these as well. And so it's an opportunity to, to do something like that. So basically, um, these are online seminars. Sometimes they're they're live. Sometimes you just do them and then post them online afterwards, kind of like what I'm doing with this lecture. Um, if you're doing something live, sometimes you're looking for maybe interaction, uh, feedback. If it's more looking for con content that's driven by questions that people have, you know, that kind of a thing, uh, that's something. Um, you know, there's a lot of debate about how long these should be. You know, some people would say 25 minutes. Some people say no more than 45 minutes. I think 45, 50 to me is about the maximum you want to do. A lot of times it really depends on what the focus is, because if it's good information and people need it and it's provided, it's presented in a very uh, uh, um, what's entertaining way, I guess is, is, is maybe not the best word, but, but you get the idea. If they're enjoying it, then, then it's, and it's fine. What we found with a lot of our live programs is that most of our views come after the fact. So we'll do a program live, we'll get a closed caption branded, and then we'll post it up online on our YouTube page, on our Facebook page. And that's where a lot of the views get. You may also have an opportunity to, to, to coordinate with other programs. And so a lot of the examples I've given have been at Purdue and mainly within FNR, but there's no rule that says you need to focus you know, in those environments. And so sometimes there's these regional things. An example of that is the Southern Regional Extension Forestry Group. Uh, they've had a long program of doing different types of webinars and, and programs and things like that. And so you may end up through your major professor or some other contact being able to do kind of a webinar uh, along these lines. And so just kind of want to just trying to give examples and things and try and give um, ideas to think about uh, as, you, as you move forward. So videos is another uh, example. And so a lot of times with videos, you're looking at kind of how to kinds of things. Um, but you're also looking at it from the standpoint of things that might be very visual. And so um, sometimes that's a challenge. And so, you know, I've done a lot of videos um, looking at forest management and wildlife management over the years. And sometimes what you see in person is difficult to translate that to video. There's a definite skill to it from that standpoint. But, it, um, you know, a lot of things that we work with in natural resources, a lot of people don't have an opportunity to see for themselves. And so, I think with a lot of things we do, they really lend themselves to video very nicely. Okay, um, you know most you know people get caught up in views, and that's just kind of some examples of different videos that we have in terms of the number of views. That changes a lot, and, and that kind of thing. We do have a YouTube page that's got uh, video uh, channels and, and playlists. And so it has all of our videos based on, on subjects and things. So if you're interested in, in kind of looking at some examples and things, you're more than 
welcome to look around on, on that page. Obviously, outside of our department, there's, there's examples as well. There really is a process to doing a video. And so we do have a, a, pr a process to do peer reviewed videos. And so these would be numbered just like the peer reviewed publications. Uh, but we also have a lot of videos that are not peer reviewed. But, you know, if you do, if you're thinking about doing a video, we do have resources to, to help you because um, you got to plan it out. And so if it's something that might involve different places that you have to go to to get shots, sometimes that might be very specific about the seasonality of it. If you're looking at, you know, plants and things like that, that may only have leaves during a certain time of year, or if you're doing some type of a herbicide application, maybe it's only good to do that during a certain time of the year. Those are things to kind of think about. The other part of planning is thinking about what what the message is, what the script is, what your shots are going to be. So typically when you plan a video, you've kind of got a script and then you've got a list of shots associated with that script. And then so some of those might be a person talking or demonstrating something. But a lot of the video is going to be B-roll where someone's talking in the background and you maybe have wide and tight shots on different aspects of the video. So we do have equipment to check out. It's not a lot, but we do have a couple cameras, uh, some tripods, and also really good wireless microphones. Uh, what we found with videos is that having good equipment is really important. So if the video shot doesn't look good, if the sound doesn't look good, um, it really kind of takes away from the, me the, the, the message you're trying to do. And so these are available for checkout uh, from Diana Evans in Forestry Building 101. And so we've got a process involved in that. We've got cases for this stuff, and so it doesn't, doesn't get broken and that kind of a thing. We also have video editing uh, assistance. So we do have a student that works for Diana uh, that does video editing. So if you work with that student, sometimes they may have a certain list of projects that they're already dedicated to. And so if you're going to do a video and you want to kind of have a discussion with Diana about planning and scheduling and things like that, not only for the equipment, if, if you need the equipment, but also for video editing. Now, you're more than welcome to do the editing yourself. Again, some people may want to do that. Uh, I've done video editing before. Sometimes I'll have some other people do it. It just kind of depends on kind of timing and, and, and that kind of a thing. But uh, uh, there's a lot of different programs out there and where we've got assistance that can, can help you as well. So again, Diane is the person to talk to about uh, about uh, videos, but she's also our information coordinator for extension. So she's got knowledge about a lot of different things, uh, but we also have an internet site that has uh, about media and branding. So it's got a lot of good information about not only things about video resources, but also ADA compliance and things like that. Uh, some really good resources for you. It also includes information about filming and, and things like that, because that's something we may not have any uh, expertise in, uh, but there's certain things you can kind of follow. And so we've got a list of resources there that, again, if that's something you want to do, you can consult with those resources and kind of plan it out appropriately. So in-person programs, and so those would be something that you give a talk in person, face to face uh, to a group, or you do some type of a, a demonstration project and you have a workshop or a field day, you invite people to, you know, those kinds of things. And so um, a limitation with these is you're, you have a limited geographic reach, right? So you're only drawing people from the local area. And so traditionally, when you do these, you may end up doing several around the state as an extension specialist, not, not in your role. Uh, but certainly these are really important. Uh, demonstration sites have long been uh, kind of the cornerstone of extension programming, not only as a kind of part of a research project, but a lot of things people want to see it done. And so they want to talk to someone who's done it. They want to see what it looks like. And so this is really a common uh, kind of a thing in forest management. So people want to see what a clear cut looks like, not only one year after that, but also 10 years, 20 years, those kinds of things. And not only that, but maybe if you've got some data associated with those practices over that time frame, they can kind of start seeing the, the full picture. And so they, they're, they're really beneficial from that standpoint. But again, Assuming the, the COVID thing kind of progresses and we get back to more and more insert person programs, this would certainly be a, a thing for, for a lot of you. <clears throat> I already talked about this. So for, for most of you, uh, an in-person program would be something that's a part of something that's already planned. 
Uh, occasionally, we do have students that actually plan the program. And so a uh, few years back, we actually had a group of students that planned a whole program at the wildlife area for kids. And so one or two of them kind of planned the whole thing. And then the, the programs were delivered by other students. And so they did the whole thing. They did the advertisement. They brought the kids there, you know, those kinds of things. Mostly what you're doing, though, is going to be a part of something. So uh, we have people in the department that every year put on, well, of course, this, this year we had things canceled, a youth workshop as part of the, the annual 4-H workshop series on campus, and that's in June. Uh, a lot of us are involved in professional development with the Wildlife Society, Society of American Foresters, American Fisheries Society. A lot of us do pesticide applicator training, those kinds of things. And so in those cases, a lot of times we're looking for content. So as an example, I put up this flyer from, from a program we did back in 2014 on invasive species management. Uh, we knew that uh, Mike Jenkins was doing, had some graduate students working on looking at how uh, plant communities respond after invasive species control. And so uh, some of the plots were local. And so we were able to do the program uh, at West Lafayette and as part of our field tour, uh, a couple of our sites were involved with a graduate student who she, her work was involved in that. So she created some information brochures about what she was doing. She did the instruction uh, from that standpoint and she showed the demonstration like her research plots talked about the data and what they're finding those kinds of things and so the, a lot of times that's how we get linked so so i'm doing this program on invasive species management i contact a couple faculty in our department who i know are working on this and sometimes it would be them that are going to do it a lot of times they're going to work with their graduate students on doing something like that so there's opportunities for those kinds of things as well If you will do something and you're gonna do the workshop, again, there are things to consider in terms of advertising, if you're gonna have food, all those kinds of things. But again, most of the time, that's not uh, uh, an issue because like most of you, if you're gonna do something like this, you're gonna coordinate with someone who's already doing all the planning. You're just providing some of the content, the educational content. And of course, evaluation is always a big part of what we do. And we'll talk about that a little more as the course progresses. And then the last thing is podcasts. And so these are recorded audio uh, thing. I think most people are familiar with, with podcasts. Uh, they have an intro, a body, and an outro. And so these are most of what the, the process is, is the body. And so there's different ways to do it. Some people would actually write this whole out where they're basically reading from a script, but they're reading in a way that it doesn't sound like they're reading. So they make it sound like they're talking. Uh, some people will say, have more bullet item kind of things, what their speaking points are, kind of like an elevator speech, I guess you can say in a way, and that they answer those, those kinds of things. But usually it's having a host and then having, the, the, having a discussion with that content thing, but it's planned out ahead of time, right? So you know what you're gonna talk about. The host may have some follow-up questions or clarification questions, those kinds of things, but, but you, you go into it knowing exactly what you're gonna do. So we do actually have a, a new program. It's called Natural Resources University, and they have several different podcast series. And so this is um, um, includes a, a deer management, a fire, a habitat, all those kinds of things, ponds. And so this is a multi uh, university project with Mississippi State, I think maybe Iowa State and a couple others. Uh, but uh, Mitch Ziske and Jared Brooke are the contacts in our department. And so if you want to do a podcast related to those themes, you can kind of look on the on the website and see what it's about. And if that fits within kind of your interests, your skill sets, uh, kind of what you want to do, then that might be an opportunity as well. And I'll, I'll just close with some final thoughts. Um, as you do programs, if you're going to do youth programs, like in person, you know, that kind of a thing. Uh, sometimes there, there are, well, I shouldn't say sometimes, there are certain requirements in terms of training and certifications that you have to have if you're gonna do that. Uh, these are online kind of deals that you go through. And so if you're, if you're working with a, the 4-H program, um, they, they are very familiar with that. And so they can, they can assist you on, on, on those kinds of things. As in, just as an example, um, uh, several of us in the department work on the state uh, wildlife 4-H uh, habitat education program. It's an annual event uh, that people kind of compete on this career development event. And then the winner gets to go to the national event, that kind of a thing. And we work with an individual from the 4-H uh, department on that. 
and that person kind of helps us kind of get involved and say, hey, we need to make, make sure you're up on this training, this training, that kind of a thing. And so it really helps from that standpoint. Uh, the second thing is plagiarism and copyright. And so if you're doing an article or something like that and you're grab, you can't just grab stuff from the internet and put it on. It has, you have to have permission to do that unless it's, or you have to cite it appropriately. If it's a, a, a site that has, uh, it's public domain, you know, those kinds of things, you have to still do that. Uh, the other thing about that is that if you're publishing content that's intended for journals, you've really got to be careful about that. And so you, if it's something that's already published, um, you can maybe you can cite that work and, and you know that that's that's totally appropriate. But usually what happens is some of the sometimes what we do is we may be doing things in a publication, an extension publication that precedes the journal. And so you want you can still do that, but you have to be careful about uh, what you put in there in terms of data, graphs and things like that. You may have to uh, change and adopt what you do based on that. And. Um, we could talk more about that in class if you have if you have questions about that and kind of give, give an example or two. But that's just something you know, just planting that seed out there that you have to be have to be aware of. Okay, uh, so that's it. That, and again, I'm just trying to give you a, a kind of a feel for different options that you can do. Uh, I think you'll find as we go through the logic model planning part of this, uh, that's going to be your outline for your plan, and it kind of may help connect some of the dots. Uh, a lot of times what we do is we'll talk individually with students, kind of if they have an idea and they want kind of some feedback. Uh, Rod and I are more than willing to, to, to do that, certainly. Uh, the purpose of this class is really to kind of help you meet the objectives uh, of the policy, but also help, help you identify kind of a path that really fits within what you want to do in terms of your research, uh, but also like your skill sets, your, your interests in, in, in a career moving forward and those types of things. So that's it. And uh, we'll see you in class this week. Thanks.